let's have real talk, cold, hard, get into it kind of talk, right? I mean, the kind of talks that we've been trying to facilitate, Absolutely. right? This is African American History Month, uh, but it's, I would say, a little bit bigger one than normal. Absolutely. And when I look back at my career, uh, th this, this should be one where, um, you know, we're stepping it up a notch, I guess I'll say. And so I was a little confused to go, what we need is that guy. So I'm dying for you as we have this real talk to help me understand why when you guys as a committee looked up, you went, okay, you know, we, we could talk to lots of people out there in my mind, you know, who are inspiring African-Americans and yet you want to have a conversation with me. I mean, the first thing for me was my experience with you initially. So um, when we sat in a circle and the Wyvern Nation is listening, that was the first encounter. I did not know who you were at all, um, just because I think you were out of quarantine at that point. Um, just barely out. So I didn't know like it was you because I wasn't really focused or paying attention on that. I was just more engaged in the dialogue and conversation. And I remember when I shared my story about my father's passing and having to drive, because I'm from Indiana and there's certain parts that we're still not welcomed in as, as African-Americans. And so just being mindful of that, having to drive to his, his burial in uniform, uh, just in the event that I did get pulled over and then just other things that have transpired here, you know, at Aviano and seeing that you actually had the heart to listen and empathize and, and try to put yourself in other people's shoes. So when I talked to the president, um, Sergeant Adade, over uh, the African American Heritage Committee, I think we realized like it starts with the head, like whoever's in charge, who's in the leadership position, it starts with them. And knowing that you, you know, want to be a part of the conversation and understand and then also learn more about our culture. Um, that inspired me because I think back to instances, you know, in history. Of course, our history didn't start with slavery, but when I think back to, uh, I'll just go back to the slavery for this instance. Um, when we talk about the slaves escaping, you know, the oppression they were under, it wasn't just African Americans helping free them. There were people that did not look like them at all that were helping and also teaching them how to read. Um, and just, I, I thought about that, or sacrificing their homes when they had the Underground Railroad to get them out uh, of bondage. So when I think about that and I think about your impact and uh, the, what you could do for this, this wing and for the squadron commanders to get, you know, them to understand, like, we need to be inclusive and have these conversations. So, and I knew that you weren't uncomfortable having the conversation. I get the luxury of working with a lot of amazing people. And uh, one of the folks that I work with here, incredibly talented, single mom, when I arrived, she had a four-year-old, I had a four-year-old, they're both, they're both just now five. Two little boys, right, they run, they play, they both like Iron Man. She described a conversation with her son, and he said, Mommy, I don't want my skin. I see my son, I'm trying to imagine how I would feel if I was looking at my son, thinking about what would be going through him. You know, without question, heartbreaking at the time. To, to every person out there who stops for a minute and thinks, oh, I get it. No, you don't. I don't get it, I'll tell you that right now. There's no way. There's no way when I talk to my child that I stop and I think about the world in front of them and how hard it's gonna be and this is just the tip of the iceberg. If my little boy looked at me and said, Daddy, I don't want my skin. I think one of the things as I was listening to you, I was just reflecting back on my childhood and how many times I felt that way. I didn't want my skin or my hair. And so um, that's why I said like, it, it's a lot of unlearning things and learning how to love yourself 
um, despite of maybe people in the world not loving you uniquely for who you are, right? So I wanted to ask you, like, as, as it relates to the conversations that we're having now, what would you say to people that are uncomfortable to have these conversations or, you know, the leaders across this wing? Right. You have to be, you have to be brave. That's, that's the first part that I would say. Uh, you know, to, to truly care about people, which is at the very core of this. That's the bottom line, care. Care enough to be brave enough to have that conversation, to, to take your ego and put it down and just accept the fact that you don't know. That, that you may form a, an opinion that's different than the one you have. You may not. Everybody comes in with their own biases and their own thoughts that are formulated from how they grew up, right? We just talked about it. You and I are shaped by the way we started. And I'm extremely thankful. I cannot thank my parents enough for, you know, speaking from a, you know, a golden rule standpoint from the beginning. I don't care. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you're, what, whether it's, religion or ethics or otherwise, the basis of this all rests in the basic human condition to desire to be treated with care and to treat others with care the same way that you would want to be treated, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their gender. It doesn't matter what those separations may be. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. And, and so that's the baseline piece. But I think when you can get to that and you can go, okay, so assume you don't know what you think you know. Put it down. Take your ego and put it down and then just go do what it takes to have the conversation. And it's going to be hard for sure. I've been told by, you know, individuals that look like me that said, you know, they've had leaders that don't really have the conversation, don't say anything to them about it, avoid it, um, or say like, you know, I don't see color, which is something I had to really reflect on because when I thought about that, I was like, well, to say you don't see color means you don't really see me because that's the first thing, honestly, that's noticed when someone walks in the room that's of another ethnicity. You see that because we can always talk about the negative things, right? Like what we go through, which it is a lot. It is a different world. It's two different worlds. Um, and before I get to that, I'll just say this, like during uh, the peaceful protests, my brother was out there, my older brother, he lives in Vincennes, Indiana. And I had him call me every day that he was out there doing that, just so I, I knew he was okay. And I had to go to work and I felt rage as well. I went to work angry that no one else had this experience that I was dealing with, sorry. No, that's real. That I was dealing with that experience. And, um, but then I, I, I asked myself, okay, how can I be a change agent just for within my sphere of influence? Because I look down at my chest and I'm like, four little stripes, like what can I do? And uh, I said, well, for Black History Month, I'm gonna be adamant about Let's have something to where we see the inventions and the things that were created because this nation was a lot of the things that were created by were by people that look like me. And when I I just think about that and I research on it, I get so proud. I think you hit on something earlier that's really, really important when we think about what people do. Discussions versus books. If I stop and talk to you and we really talk, I can't just take the emotions and make them go away. Feel the emotions. Question what you think, what you believe. At least force yourself to explore it. And it's hard, but it's something that's required. It's got to be done. That it's not about how you look or whether you're a boy or a girl. It's about how you act. And importantly, Martin Luther King Jr. states that you not be judged by the color of your skin, 
but by the conduct of your character. I think as African Americans, we, we have a different struggle because we have to learn to unlearn learned behavior. Um, I've had people that, uh, you know, I'll be at the schoolhouse and they'll come over and they'll look at everyone else and pan and then they won't look at me and, and go back the other way. I've seen things like that, I've dealt with it and, um, and it's, it sucks because you feel like you're invisible in those moments. Um, but to be seen for who you are and what you are capable of and your character, that's what my dad always said. That's what you need to be seen for. Um, and the right people will see it. So growing up knowing that no matter what I do, it wasn't enough. That's how I felt. And I still feel like uh, to this day, that's instilled in me and it's still there, which is why I said trying to unlearn, learn behavior because my parents always said, you have to be 10 times better than everyone else. You have to work harder. You have to have a harder drive and go, 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 um, because it is not going to be easy for you in this world. So that's what they used to tell my brother and I. But I, I know that learning about my culture was something my parents were both really passionate about and um, just embracing who I am naturally. But Even at younger ages? Yes, sir. But I, I will just say, like, I felt like the oddball. I remember my first encounter. Uh, I, we went to a Christian school when we were, my brother and I, when we were in elementary. And we were the only, I think we were two of four black children in the school. And I just remember feeling like, why, why do I get treated differently? And you did. You mm -hmm. got treated differently. Absolutely. And sometimes it was subtle. When I started really getting into basketball, I wanted to play on this AAU team. There was a couple of my friends were on the team, and I was the only black girl that tried out on this AAU team, and I didn't make it. And I remember my father sitting down and having a conversation with me, and he was mad at them. He had the conversation, and then I had to really learn to figure out how to love myself. So he started you know, putting me in communities where I could see individuals that looked more like me but they wanted us to go to the best schools. So um, unfortunately, those schools were not in the inner city. So township schools is where you know we started out at. I remember when I joined the military, the first time I was ever told, because I'm really quiet, I think a lot, I don't smile a lot. I'm sure you've seen that. This is probably the most I've smiled, but uh, I don't smile a lot. So being told you look angry those things, they bother you they, because those are negative connotations that have always been associated, especially with African-Americans and particularly women. Um, so saying I look angry um, and also saying like I'm difficult um, because I don't really express my emotions well. So I had to have this conversation with someone recently because in my community, you're, you're taught like suppress your emotions, like when my father passed, I suppressed a lot of that. And still, I'm trying to talk about it now more. Um, but going to seek counseling or therapy or just talk in your household, it wasn't a thing growing up. My dad was a suppressor too. So there's a lot of cultural differences. And then, you know, my hair. <laughs> um, that's something that I think I've really learned to embrace as I've um, been in the military, it was tough because I used to get relaxers so it'd be straightened uh, chemically. And it was because I wanted to fit into the, the standard of beauty that's, you know, surrounded us for centuries. And then I just had to learn, I have to embrace who I am and be uniquely me, regardless of whether people, you know, like it or not. You, know, you, you highlighted the challenge you know, with maybe the way, the way you carry yourself, right? Or whether you smile or don't smile. Um, and I, you know, I'm, because I don't know, right? Uh, there probably is something to that, you know, when you add in the, the color component. Um, but that's definitely something that can affect anybody. And you have to process what's happening. I mean, did you process it right off the bat? Did you look at it and you're like, wait a minute, I'm better than they are. I mean, I don't know whether you were or not, but. I didn't. My father actually said that to me because they actually came out and told him, one of the coaches. Uh, he later told me they didn't want anyone of color on their team. And that was hard to take. 
um, because I really wanted to play with them. Like I said, my friends were on the team because I had been in the environment of being around Caucasian people like growing up. So it was it was tough. I didn't look at it like. Um, but, but, but why, you know, why would you expect that, right? If you've spent your time with your parents telling you that, right, that it's about everybody, it's, a, it's about how you act. And then you go into a scenario like that. Okay, well, I guess I, guess I didn't play well enough today or whatever. It would be very logical for you to have that perspective until you're confronted with it. I'm guessing that's the first time that you ran into that. Is that the first time that your father had to have, you know, something that's in the vicinity of the talk? It wasn't. Uh, I, I got my license at 16. <laughs> and I remember him telling me to keep everything uh, up in the visor. So that way when, uh, I, if I, I did get pulled over, and I did a couple times being asked, like, what are you doing out here? Grappling for the first time with, um, this has been taken away from me because I look different. Oh, absolutely. That was the first time for that. Absolutely. And it, it wasn't the last. Uh, I ended up playing on a team in Ohio. And we were playing basketball, and we had a game, and there was racial slurs that were thrown out. When I played basketball for Lawrence North High School uh, before I transferred to Arlington, um, we went and played at Brownsburg, and there were racial slurs being thrown out. And I think that's the thing is, like, we're always taught, like, just turn the other cheek, don't do anything. And um, It was tough. You know, when you, when you talk about that experience as a nine-year-old, yeah, you definitely had experiences after that. But I expect that was uh, seismic, volcanic, because it's probably the first time that you have to stop and look inside and ask yourself what's wrong with you. I ask that question did. often after that. I ask that often, like, what's wrong with me? And it all starts right there, the first time. Wound deep, I think. I think, as you said, like, being brave, it, it's on both sides, right? So people have to be brave enough to tell their stories. And I've had conversations with some African-Americans that are like, oh, it's not my job to educate, but how will people know? People learn more from our personal experiences than sometimes they will in a book. And so I've had to have that conversation. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, God, thank you. Um, no, I mean it for a few reasons. Uh, you know, the distinction you just made, I'll start by going, yep, and, and I can tell you I've seen that, right? And for so many different reasons, even that very first listening session, uh, and, and we're not going to stop that. Um, you know, it's funny you talk about the, some of the different things when we, when we talk origins. Again, you know, probably a naive little kid, uh, for me, but, um, you know, when I studied history as a kid, when I was taught history, let's not pretend I, I don't want to go to school like anybody else, uh, you know, but melting pot is the discussion, right? That is the origin of America. That is the background. It's the melting pot. And it's, uh, you know, I, I watched Saturday morning cartoons and, you know, and melting pot was one of the Ones that you see, right? Might be dating myself here, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was it was Schoolhouse Rocks. It was all about the melting pot, and it's everybody. You said color. Schoolhouse Rock. Schoolhouse Rock. Well, I used to watch yeah. that. <laughs> so Schoolhouse Rocks. One of them is on the melting pot, and, and and it was. I remember it because it reinforced the things that my parents told me, and it's mm -hmm. some of the most important seeds that will be planted will not be from somebody who looks like me. It'll come from somebody who looks like you, who has that willingness to speak. And what I can push on is to tell everybody who looks like me to be brave enough to listen. Thank you.
That means a lot. Well, I appreciate your time. <laughs> it means a lot to just be able to have this conversation and um, to just be able to be vulnerable. I think that's something I have struggled with in the past, especially being security forces by trade and going over to ALS. But um, this conversation has, it's really like empowered me. The topic of, of race and um, you know, being inclusive in work centers has been something that I've really been passionate about. And just people understanding that there's, there's a, a beauty to seeing what's different about people instead of associating it with something negative. Yeah. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>